Okay, let's pray and then we will go ahead and I'll go ahead and start the uh, the the teaching tonight. Um, and thank you for coming. Uh, it's just that you're very far. I'll be speaking alone here. <laughs> That's okay. So let's pray. Uh, God, we thank you for this opportunity that we can be in your house once again. Uh, thank you that we can be here to listen, to hear your word, and even desire to do your word. So we ask you to be with us tonight. Uh, bless our time and let our, let our hearts be open to hear you, Lord. And let's be able to apply what we learn for the glory and honor of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so for those who are with us last uh, Wednesday, uh, I'm going through the book of Mark, uh, and there's a reason to why I'm very much focused on the New Testament. It's more of my area, and I get to preach in the Old Testament. I get to teach in the Old Testament, uh, and I have no bias for the two books. It's one Bible, God's Word. Uh, but somehow in these teachings or in these Bible studies, I want us to uh, focus on the book of Mark for this time and maybe move to another New Testament book when we are done. And I'm trying to be, I'm, I'll be very fast with the book of Mark. Um, I love it. It's short and direct to the point. doesn't beat about the bush. Um, Mark doesn't give a lot of details. It's just the word of Jesus and the deeds of Jesus. That's very important for Mark. What Jesus says, what Jesus teaches, and what he does. And uh, I, for those who were with us last Wednesday, I gave a background of the book of Mark, which I'm not going to do, but I'm very much, I, I really like the way Mark just brings the point of why he's writing the, the book. The gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's what he wants to prove to the hearers, to the people around, and to us today, why he's so much focused on Jesus, the Son of God, and the gospel that he brings from God. And last week I said, He's going to do this, and he is going to use at least five things that prove, uh, that are supposed to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he has come with the message or the gospel of God to save the world. That's what he's trying to do. And immediately you read chapter 1, he introduces uh, the fulfillment of, of scriptures through the prophets. He says, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, saying, prepare ye the way, prepare the way for the Lord. And you see these words coming from the book of Isaiah and coming from the book of Malachi. So one of the things he's doing is Christ has come to fulfill what was spoken by the prophets. So he's fulfilling that. That's number one, fulfilling the words of the prophets, that Jesus Christ is the person that we were waiting or people were supposed to wait because he's the one who's been bringing the good news, even the good news of salvation. So he will use prophets or the, the scripture to prove that this is the person you guys are to put your trust in. You guys are supposed, we are supposed to look into. He is going to beat on that throughout the, 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 the book. And the other thing he's going to use, uh, he's going to use the prophets or the, uh, the fulfillment of scripture. He's going to use uh, uh, the voice from above. God saying, for example, when we read last week, this is my son. In whom I'm well pleased. In another place he says, this is my son. Listen to him. So God is confirming that Jesus is the Christ or Jesus 
is the bringer or the one who brings the gospel, the good news of our salvation. So the prophets or the scripture are testifying to that, number one. Then God himself speaks from heaven. Then the Holy Spirit is also confirming that Jesus Christ is the Savior or is the Messiah or is the one bringing the good news. And then we see angels also confirming this. And what the, the greatest, greatest thing that Mark is going to show us through the book is the deeds of Jesus Christ, miracles and signs and wonders that he performs are not just for spectacular things that we can admire and go, wow. But rather, these are things that he performed that they may direct us back to look unto Jesus. So even the miracles themselves are not being, you know, these days, man, I'm tired of these preachers. Man. We act like uh, all these miracles is because we are anointed and we are, we are the men of God. We are the people with the power. Look unto us. That's not what the gospel is all about. These things are happening and will continue to happen so that people can be pointed back to who Jesus is. That this is the Savior of the world. Amen. So even the angels are talking about him. And today we are taking it uh, further. So we are going to look some of the miracles. But before even we do that, which I'm going to read now, chapter 1. Let's do the last part of chapter 1, verse 16 uh, onwards. And I will read 16 uh, through uh, 20. And then, oh, sorry. So Mark chapter, six, chapter 1, verse 16. Are you there? If you have your Bible. Okay, let me read. So verse 16 says, uh, So passing uh, alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Samson and Andrew, uh, the brother of Simon, uh, who, are, who were casting a net into the sea. For they, is that 16? Yeah. And for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, uh, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat and with the hired men servants and followed him. So last week I was, uh, and this is very important in our teaching today. So the good news about Jesus Christ is not just about uh, pro proclamation. Like, Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. And then we pack our briefcases and go home and say, well, we proclaim the message. Uh-uh. For Jesus, Jesus is setting an example, uh, a pattern from the very beginning. The what is important is the proclamation. But more than that is inviting or bringing people into the kingdom, into the good news, into the message so that they may leave the message. So the first thing he's going around after all this, after the baptism, he goes to pray in the wilderness. He comes back and he starts going around bringing people into the team. So sometimes you say, well, he's just calling, he's calling his disciples. He's doing more than that. He's reaching out to them. We, and Mark doesn't give the details. But it seems like they know who Jesus is. So they're, just, they're not just following a stranger who they just met, telling them, follow me. And they leave their nets and that's just follow. No, it seems like they have been observing what he's doing. They have heard what he has started doing. And when he reaches them and says, come on, leave your nets, follow me. The two brothers leave their net and they follow Jesus. James and his brother John, they hear from him like, leave your nets and follow me. And they leave their nets and follow him. Now, the following is not just following like, okay, whatever you do, wherever you go, whatever you want to do, we'll behind, we will be, we will be behind you. No. 
It's actually being invited to the new life. That has its way of living. Its way of doing things. Its way of its own language. Can I say that? Yeah. Amen. I, I, I thought I was just, just going to be, to be calm. And, but uh, it, it seems like it's not easy. So it's not just proclamation. It's coming to him. That you may hear him. That you may follow him. But in the following, he's teaching you how to live in this newfound life. So we have a bunch of believers or followers or maybe members who just come because it's church. We just, oh, where do you go to church? I just go to, yeah, and this is what we do. We just meet on a Sunday morning. Well, we sing our songs and we go home. That's true. But it's more than that. He's calling us into a new life. A new life that is demonstrated in how we interact. How we speak, how we interact with others, our way of life. Did you know, and God help us here, if we can live the Christian life, and this is not a really high, higher calling, like it's way out there, no. If we live the Christian faith, I'm repeating, this is what I said last week. It's very easy to speak about salvation if you are living the salvation. Can you imagine if you met somebody who has never tasted honey and then you're explaining to that person how, how honey tastes? I mean, so it tastes like sugar, so you put it in your mouth and you're like, oh man, it's just, it's, it's, it's kind of thick and no, just give them honey and they will explain it. <laughs> It, it becomes easy when we live our faith. It becomes easy for us to explain who we are and what we believe and what we stand for. It becomes easy. So Jesus is going to call disciples. And he will disciple them so they may live the life that he's, he's preaching about. So he goes uh, and finds Peter, Simon and his brother. And then he finds James and his brother, and they start following him. Remember what he said before we left last week, that the message is about repentance and forgiveness. He doesn't say it here, but he's calling them to repentance and forgiveness to begin a new life in him. Are we together? And after that, then, the calling. So this is what I want to emphasize tonight also. So God, Christ calls us to himself. So that we may live a life that is associated with him, patterned in his way. And by that, he's also calling us to call others to the kingdom. It's so sad that sometimes we leave everything to the preacher. You preach the word of God, reach out, go find them wherever they are, bring them to the church. We will greet them and have good time with them. It's more than just being there to wait. It's about us also reaching us, reaching out. And it becomes easy. If Paul hears the message, for example, and he goes out and says, oh, man, I had the word, man. I mean, this is what has happened in my life. This, I wasn't the way you, saw, you, you see me now. Something just happened in me. And I'm like, what is that? I, I, uh, Christ just changed my life. I'm not the way you see me. I wasn't the way you see me now. I'm really new. I'm reaching out. But the problem is we leave it to the others. We leave it to the preacher. We leave it to the, and our neighbors are there. Some of us, we don't, our neighbors don't even know that we go to church. They see us disappear in the morning. 
<laughs> and then afternoon we are back. But where, you, where were you guys? But where we went out. We just had fun out there, and we are back. Oh, really? It's about having fun? Isn't it about new life? Is it not about new beginning? Is it not about hope that's coming of a better life than what we are having right now? The kingdom that's coming? So he calls his disciples and then he starts showing them his deeds. So from now going on, from those verses going on, Jesus will be teaching and performing miracle signs and wonders from more teaching and demonstrating what he's teaching. So read me, uh, let's, let's get to the next verses, 20, 21 and 28. It's the longest passage this evening, but I'm going to read it very quickly. So uh, what, uh, what have I said uh, now? That Christ is going out to call disciples to follow him, but not only just following, but preparing people who can bring, in, bring many into the kingdom. Isn't that what we are called to do? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel? Verse 21. So, and they went, uh, uh, went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. The, the, the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirit, and they obey him. And, uh, and at once his fame spread everywhere through all the surrounding region of Galilee. So Jesus is beginning to show who he is by his teaching and what he's going to do. So here, here's what I want us to understand here. Jesus is coming into the synagogue and people are used to the normal things. The scribes say, so Jesus teaches them, and they're like, what kind of a teacher? Is? They, are, they are astonished at how Jesus teaches. Because the, the scribes would say, oh, Rabbi so-and-so said so this, and Rabbi so, they will quote a rabbi and another rabbi and another rabbi and another rabbi. They had no authority to say, this is what I am saying. This is who I am. I have been sent by God. Remember when he went into the synagogue uh, in the book of Luke uh, uh, last, uh, two weeks ago, I said this. He goes in and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Deliverance and liberty. And he gives a list of what he has come to do. Not any scribe would stand and say, the spirit is on me. He has sent me. There is nothing like that. It's only when they hear Jesus and they say like, this guy speaks with authority. Who is he? So I want to give you a very good, important point here in the book of Mark. In the book of Mark, the people are wondering who Jesus is. We know because we have read already and we know from chapter 1 to the last chapter, 16, we know. 
But in the whole, in the entire book, the disciple seems to be to not understand who this guy is. They are in the crowd with him every day, but they are always surprised, like, who is it? So there's a question in Mark, like, Mark is trying to answer the question, who is this Jesus? What is he doing? Who can do this? Very important for Mark. that He's, like, unfolding things, and they, are, they go like, oh, wow, we thought we saw that, now we are seeing this. Who is this? The prophets knew, God knows, the spirit knows, the angels know who Jesus is. Here we are told even the demons know who Jesus is. That, me, that gives me, that, gives, that pumps me, man. Like even the enemy devil certain knows who Jesus is. And did you know sometimes we are really fearful of the dark, of the, 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 the world of the, dark, the, dark, the darkness? Uh, we, we, we wonder what is Satan going to do. And we live in this fear like, we, I don't know. No, let me tell you, even demons, they know who Jesus is. I, man, I, I should have an amen for that. <laughs> They know who Jesus is. And we, we are Christians. Sometimes we are really scared of the devil. And we think like he will kill us. He will not. He will not because he knows the Christ who is in us. <laughs> That's why the Bible is very clear, saying the, the one who is in us is greater than the one who is, in, who is outside there. So the demons, demons are crying. Hey, Jesus, have you come to destroy us before our time? We know who you are. Oh, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Have you come to destroy us before our time? And Jesus is like, shut up and get out of here. Authority, man. The teaching has authority. The deeds are demonstrating authority. We can walk boldly knowing who is in us. Can I hear an amen for that? Can we hike our shoulder and boast in the Lord that he knows, we know who, who, we, who we are in him? In the book of Acts, there's a story that I like to visit every time. So Paul is going around and healing people and casting out demons and people are setting free. And there was a man by the name, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Scavi, the sons of Scavi. They were going around also trying to cast out demons, but they had no relationship with Christ. So one time, this evil spirit asked this, this young man, Jesus, we know. We know Paul. We know Jesus. Who are you? And the story, the story says... Uh, the demons just wiped these boys, man. They just kicked them, beat them up, and they go home. <laughs> Don't play around. <laughs> it's about relationship with Christ. It's not just playing religion. So that's the number. So in every chapter, we will see this. Either God is speaking 
Either angels are ministering, either the spirit is confirming, or Jesus is fulfilling scriptures. And we will see in other occasions where the spirit is, uh, the evil spirits are crying out, Hey, leave us alone. Have you come to destroy us before our time? Which tells me also that the demons know their time is coming when they will be put in the right place. Can I hear you? Amen. So, sometimes there's the debate about demons, exorcism, casting out demons. You know, and sometimes I say, if we can go to the scripture, if we can learn the word of God the way it is and exp expound and explain it the way, we wouldn't be having so many discussions about issues that are very clear in the text. Say amen. What is clear is clear. How many of you, if you bought some uh, uh, beef and then you, it has bones, and if you can't eat, if, if the bones are there, do you guys like chew the bones and try to, you just eat the meat. There is very clear there. It's easy for you. Just eat the meat. Leave the hard things you will learn by and by. Hello. There are things when I was a new Christian, I didn't understand. For example, the book of Matthew. And that somebody was telling me, read the King James Version. Then I'm going chapter 1, verse 1, about this begot, this, and this begot, this. I'm like, what's begotting, begotting? <laughs> but now I can go back to that and teach things that 10, 20 years ago, I would never have understood. Eat what is clear in the text. So Jesus uh, goes in and he delivers. One of the things that I want to point out in the book of Mark, Jesus is very compassionate about those who are outsiders. People who seem not to matter in the community. People who you wouldn't consider to be the guys in the city. The lepers, the demon possessed, women. It's interesting, the next verse, the, 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 the following verses that we are going to read, the first miracle of a physical miracle in the book of Mark is directed to a woman. And women were like, ah, ha, 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 ha. this is not for you. This is for men. So Mark has a tendency of reaching out those. That's why one thing I love about the, our church here, this church here, is a spirit of reaching out for those that mo most of the people won't even care about. And I love it. Because such people, they have a really, real hunger for God. They have really, really, really tangible problems. If you tell them God can help, they will listen because they need the help. When you tell them God can deliver you, they will listen because they need the deliverance. But can you imagine a bunch of religious leaders who have been in it for 50 years? You said deliverance, like, what's that? I'm already in it. I'm, I'm okay. But Mark is a good book for us because every move, you, every step you take in Mark, you see somebody who was really neglected, who didn't make up in the community. Christ reaches out for that person. Either through healing, 
delivering, speaking good words to that person, encouraging them. And that's why I love the short book of Mark. It's just pam, pam, immediately, 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 next, immediately, and immediately, and immediately. So in verse 29, let's read verse 29 through 34. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew and James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. Whew. Wow. These are things they have never seen. After casting the demons and doing that, then they go together with the new disciples. Now, they have never seen this. Peter and his friends go to the house, and Peter's mother-in-law was sick. She had a fever. And she's supposed to serve them. She's a woman, right? She's supposed to serve them. Cook for them. Give them food. And that lady is sick. And Jesus is told about it. And he reaches out. And says, you are healed. Just, just stand up. And she's delivered and healed immediately. And she starts cooking for them. Whew. Are you feeling like, like he doesn't give you a break, man? Mark does not give you a break. He doesn't give you time to make his aunt adding things on top of things on top of things. And then the next thing that I want to dwell in tonight, very important in the book of Mark, the miracles are demonstrating who Jesus is. The deliverances are pointing to who Jesus is. But Jesus is not doing this in his own power. Like, humanly speaking, as man. He is God. He is man. He relies entirely on God. I wish... We can realize that we cannot do it without God. I'm, I'm so afraid that sometimes we believers take things for granted. Like, if we, uh, it's okay. That's not how Jesus operates. That's not how he, he shows himself. He will do the healings here, do the miracles here, and he will run and go hide and seek God's presence, God's anointing, God's refreshing. I don't man, I can just sit down and uh, I'm trained. I can just sit down and open the Bible and get three points. One, two, three, and come here and say three points. One, two, three. I've been trained. I know I can read the Bible, come up. I can do that. I don't have to do many things. I can just go and sit down, open the book of Ephesians and come up with three points and come here and two. Three points. One, do this. Three, do just finish up. How much would I be effective if I can tell God, I know this, but how much can it help if your presence will be with us? If you can help me communicate clearly to the people. If you can help set free that new guy who came to church. I will preach, but how much I would desire that God, you minister to your people. 
it will change things. Let me repeat that. I feel I think, I think I should do it again. How much would it would I be a, of a blessing to you? With the training that I have, that I can sit for five minutes and come up with a sermon. Wake me up in the middle of the night and say, Daniel, you have ten minutes to preach. I'll come up with something. I've been trained. But how much if you could have told me a week or two days ago, and then I take time to prepare, but at the same time I say, God, if you're not going to help them, I can't. I'm just a vessel. I'm your servant. They need to experience your presence. They need to experience your love. They need to experience who you are. They, may, they need to experience your power in their lives. And then I come that Sunday, I preach, and everybody's like, oh, you just spoke to me. Yeah. They, uh, they, they can't see what I'm doing. Let me go back here. <laughs> if we can receive from there vertically before it goes horizontally, people would be helped. But if it's from here to you, I can give you good head knowledge. I have it. I'm serious. I have it. But how much I desire that God may help me to, to open myself to God. And he may pour himself to me that I may pour out to you. And that's what Jesus, the next verses are saying. Let's read the next verses here. What verses are we now? Huh? 32? That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick and oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Wow. Verse 35. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a, a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him, and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next town, that I may preach there also, for this is why I came out. Came out. And he went through all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. So here is a situation where now Jesus is becoming popular. And the disciples are very much excited about the miracles. Hello, are we together? The, the, the disciples are really excited about what Jesus is doing. Healing, delivering, speaking good words. And then Jesus is finishing the meetings and he goes out early in the morning to pray. Like, God, I still need it fresh from you. I need to hear from you. I need to. I need you. I want to do your will. And the disciples are so much used to things like, hey, people are looking for you all over. You're becoming famous. Where, where are you? They are waiting. Reminds me of this uh, one time I was helping another young preacher back uh, in Kenya. I'm like, man. He's doing meetings like he will go to one city, one city for a week, and go to another city for a week, another city for a week, another city for a week, maybe one whole month without seeing the wife or the children. The guy is just preaching and preaching and preaching. So one time I met him in town, I asked him, 
You've been gone a long time. You need to recharge. You can't be gone. You need time with God. You can't be doing this. Even Jesus took time. He ran away. Literally, it's like he ran out of the crowds and went to be with God because he needed to be alone to recharge. And sometimes we need that. Not sometimes. We need that. So Jesus will take time to pray. Are we still together? Jesus would take time to pray. He didn't take anything for granted. Like I'm already the son of God. I'll do this. I know how to do it. No, he knew. Because he was still in this body too. He needed help from God the Father. Are we still together? And so next week, I'll finish the last part of chapter 1 so we can go to chapter 2. But here's what I've been saying. Number one, we've been called or we've been invited or we've been called into the kingdom so that we may be channels of bringing others into the kingdom. Let me put it very simple. The reason you have met Christ is so that you may be a vessel to reach out for people to know Christ. I don't need to know all the Bible to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Hello? Let me, let me. I don't need to know everything and all the theology that's out there. One time, Jesus restored the eyes of this guy in the book of John on a Sabbath. And the religious leaders were arguing, who is this guy that healed you on the Sabbath? This guy doesn't know the rules of our religion. Why would, you, why would he heal you on a Saturday? He doesn't know how we operate the church or the synagogue. So the guy said, well, there's a guy who just uh, touched me and I received my side. And it's like I'm excited about this. He's a sinner. He should not do this on the Sabbath. I'm trying to emphasize something here. You don't have to know everything, all the theology that's out there to say, tell somebody about Jesus. Finally, this guy is like, okay, guys, I don't have all that you're talking about. But one thing I know, I was blind and now I can see. Who did it? They call him Jesus. Just talk to him. Talk to him. He did it. If you get, he was very bold. He said, do you guys also want to be his followers? Because I can see. You might want to go and check on him. I don't have to know any, everything. I can tell my friend. I say, you know what? You talk about struggling with that. I know. I was there. But something happened in my life. Christ changed me. He can do it for you. Christ forgave my sins. He can forgive your sins. He calls disciples so that they can go out and make disciples. He's calling them into the kingdom so they can call others into the kingdom. He will train them and then one time he will send them out to go and do exactly what he's been teaching them. We will see that as we continue. So number one, that I'm one, one, number one thing that I'm emphasizing in these uh, verses that we have read. It's about being disciples who can reach out to make other disciples. And you don't have to be this Billy Graham to fill a stadium. You can just reach a person and tell them of the love of Christ. The other thing that I'm seeing just keeps on coming here, coming here, is Jesus is all, is the word 
and the deeds, the word and the deeds are, are complementing one another. He says it and it happens. This can give us the boldness like whatever Christ promises, he will do it. I might not know when, what time, but I know he's very faithful. And the other thing that I'm emphasizing that in these verses that we have read, the importance of prayers in the life of a Christian. The place of prayer in the life of a believer. You can't take things for granted. Pray for your kids. Pray for your neighbor. Pray for the people you work with. Uh, there was a time when I, about two, uh, a year ago, when Matt told me that I would, he wants me to be speaking to his team, World Congress team. And I was really scared. Not because I can't, I don't have a sermon. I have many sermons. <laughs> but I like these guys, man. They look tough and crooked. I'm so, don't go tell them. <laughs> man, man they, they look tough and like, do I really want to talk to these guys? But it, had, it turned out they were the most. It, I, I had a very beautiful time with them because the hearts are open. You can tell you are speaking to people who really want to hear and do what you're telling them. It took me a lot of prayers. I didn't take it for granted. Who knows, man? They are all white. Hello? <laughs> Turns out they are very loving people. You see, sometimes we create these barriers when people are already open to you, but we create these boundaries, and they are not even there sometimes. It's just here. Not really. Not real. And here I am again. Very happy to be here. To tell you, we should not take things for granted. Pray for things. Pray for what you want to do. Ask God to help you. God, I'm going to, I, I want to do this. Please help me. I don't know how I will do it. And sometimes a good prayers are those prayers when you don't know what to do. Hello, let me repeat that. Sometimes it turns out the best prayers are those prayers when you, that you don't know what to do. Like, I really don't know what to do, God. I really don't. I don't know how to deal with this. And that's what Jesus is. is Mark is not detailed, but that's, Mark is telling us, Jesus is not just performing miracles and just loving them and taking it for granted. He wants to spend time with God so that every time he comes to minister, it's fresh and things are happening for the glory of God. Do we give time to say, I'm going for this interview, let me pray. I'm going to, I'm going to see this guy, let me pray about it. Let me pray about it. It reminds me of the first time I was coming to the U.S. and I was flying and somebody was to meet me at Chicago airport and I was thinking, God, if this guy doesn't show up, what do I do? And I'm told Chicago is rough. That's the story we know about. So I'm thinking, okay, God. Please, I'm in this plane, but when I land, please help me to see the guy who is to meet me. Otherwise, you, I'll be in trouble. Then I ch take my luggage, I go to the custom, I'm cleared, and I can't find the guy. So I'm like, okay, I wait for five minutes, nobody. 
10 minutes, nobody. I'm like, okay. All the other people are gone because their friends came and picked them up. And there I was. I don't know what to do. I'm praying, God, you better bring this guy. If he doesn't show up, I don't know what to do. So I decide, well, let me just walk out of this building. Maybe he's outside waiting. I walk out and there's nobody. And I walk back in and I'm seeing this guy holding a... And I go around and I check and it has my name on it. I say, are you looking for Danny? It's me! But I was praying, and maybe I should not con uh, say much, but I really love to pray. I make it as part of my life. I just want to pray and ask God for wisdom, uh, to ask God to help me. So that I don't just do things because I'm smart. Who cares if you are smart if you miss it? What if you are smart and you miss what God wants, wants me to do? It's more than being smart. It's more than being experienced. It's more than being knowledgeable. It's about putting our trust in God, in him. So today, we have a business of making others to know Christ. We have a business to pray. We have a business with the word of God. Let me stop there so I can continue chapter 2 next week. God bless you. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for the way you are teaching us. The acts of Jesus and the words that he speaks, the time he takes to seek you. Your word says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. The time he spends to pray, the time he spends to ask for your direction. I pray that God, you may help us to put this into practice. Not taking anything for granted, but realizing that we need you in our lives. So, I pray that you help us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Go with these two things tonight. Three is the word. But these two things, discipling is important, prayer is important in the book of Mark. God bless you.